they, they kind of evolved together. Um, I mean, this book has sort of sat in my head for a long time. I, um, you know, I first got really actively interested in noir fiction um, when I was still living in New York in my mid twenties, and, and underwent a deep immersion into the into the genre. And at around that time, I thought this would be a. Gr I'd love to write something in this form. And I was also deeply enmeshed in um, and, and remain deeply enmeshed in in blues music. And I think you know what's interesting to me about both of them is that. Um, Obviously, they come. They're completely different in terms of their historical, um, you know, their historical framework and, and their context and where they come out of. But both, for me, as a um, as an aficionado, were essentially, um, you know, presented originally blues in like the twenties and thirties and noir when it really broke in the thirties and forties and fifties as kind of disposable folk art in a certain sense. It wasn't, you know, the mainstream didn't take it seriously. It kind of operated on the fringe. And I always saw a kind of conversation that the blues and noir were having in a certain way, um, both basically because both of them were talking about survival and degradation in a, in a way like the underside of the kind of American dream or the American mythos, which is something that as a concept has just interested me for most of my adult life. And so I, 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 I was, you know, they, those two threads kind of developed simultaneously. I wanted to have those two elements in conversation with each other. It took a long time to figure out how exactly to do that, a lot of trial and error. Uh, but the impetus to discuss or include both of them throughout the book was, was there from the very outset. Are you a musical person? Like, are you like a weekend musician or anything? I'm a, yeah, I'm a, I mean, at one point I was a very serious amateur player, um, you know, played in bands, made recordings and all that kind of stuff. I'm not that serious uh, anymore, but I do, yeah, weekend, you know, some people play golf, I play guitar. <laughs> B blues guitar? Um, yes, a little bit. Uh, more rock and roll guitar, but a bit of blues guitar. You know, I, I did go um, a few years ago with my brother to Fur Peace Ranch, Yorma Kalkinen's, uh guitar camp in southeastern Ohio, where we you know spent three or four days learning um, free blues uh, style finger picking. So I've done some, but um, I'm you know I'm, I'm what did Elvis Costello call himself? Little hands of concrete. Well, if he's if he's little hands of concrete, I'm like giant hands of concrete. So there's <laughs> not that much nuance in my play. <laughs> right, right. But you, I mean, in your writing, it seems very knowing. It feels like an informed voice. I've just wait. It makes I mean, sense to yeah, me that I mean, you would play. I've been listening to that music for, like I said, for, you know, 40, 50, well, how old am I now? Like about 45 years. And so, you know, all the way through. Started, of course, with the, you know, with the British blues rockers. And then from there kind of discovered all of the, that great original work. And, um, you know, and, and have carried it with me ever since. It's the most, it's as moving a body of, a collective body of work or, you know, kind of form as I've, I've ever encountered. So this is very much L.A. Noir. And I love this genre. I love it as a moviegoer. I love it on the page. And I know a little bit about it. I took a film noir class. I was a film student in undergrad. But as I was reading, I was thinking to myself, like, is there a set of rules? I mean, there are certain tropes that you have to kind of play if you're writing a noir story. But is there something that you were working from, like any kind of defined parameters? I mean, I was working from a bunch of para defined parameters. Some of them had to do with the genre. Some of them had to do with the structure of the book. Just, you know, as, for example, the book is 13 Question Method. It's based on a, um, on a Chuck Berry, or it's not based on, the title comes from a Chuck Berry song from the late 50s, a sort of a novelty song in a certain way, which I first heard, in fact, before I ever heard Berry's version of it, I first heard Ry Cooter's version of it, which was recorded in the late 80s. Uh, and Cooter did it as a Delta blues song. It's like a he did a finger picking blues style. So in some ways too, in terms of the confluence of noir and blues, that song kind of felt like it had both of those things, um, going on. Um, but as far as the, you know, and so one of the, one of the structural game, I like, I like games. This is, this is my own structure. You know, the book has, it's 13 question method it has 13 chapters and all of the chapters, each of the chapters is 13 pages long. So I would like that kind of structural device. That has nothing to do with noir. That just has to do with my own obsessive personality and my love of kind of puzzles and, you know, creative games and things like that. Um, as far as the other stuff goes, what I, I was less concerned with sort of the rules. I wanted to write a classic noir, a book that was really sort of classic, you know, mid 20th century, like 40s, 50s noir. I wanted to write one that wasn't exactly an homage, but that was operating in the kind of throwaway territory, like the ace paperback territory. You know, it was sort of inspired by writers like Jim Thompson and David Goodis and 
um, Darcy B. Hughes. I also wanted to write uh, an existential novel in the vein, say, of um, The Stranger. And so those kind of influences it were in my head. Camus was influenced by James M. Cain. I was obviously influenced by James M. Cain. Um, at one point, you know, before I... I always knew the title of the book, but at one point when I was conceptualizing it, I thought of it as triple indemnity rather than double indemnity. So there's all of those, you know, all of those confluences, and I wanted to be aware of them. And I've also put in some Easter eggs in the book, you know, lines I've borrowed from other novels or, you know, just if you, you know, if you know, you know, you'll have, there'll be like a little riff, like a little quote of some sort, which is also a kind of a musical um, idea. But I was more interested in, I liked those novels because they were tight and taut and because they didn't offer false reassurance or redemption. In fact, the whole point of that work, as I read it, was to really argue against false redemption or false, um, false conclusion or false resolution. Um, and I had been reading a lot of that kind of classic noir. I'd also been reading a lot of contemporary noir, which I have read throughout. And a lot of contemporary noir to me seemed both a little bit bloated. The books, are lo get lo the books get longer and longer as we kind of move through history. And also, even the, even the hardest ones, um, and by hard, I mean, you know, toughest, right? You know, like, like Simenon has these novels that he wrote called, he called them Roman Dur, which is the hard novels. They're not the Maigret novels. They're, they, a lot of them take place in the U.S. And they're also very, like, existentially centered and existentially bleak. You know, I, even though, even the contemporary noir, or a lot of the contemporary noir that plays with those areas kind of backs away at the end, or often backs away at the end, and offers some kind of softer ending, or, you know, things get resolved, and the person who we thought was, was, was not capable of redemption finds it. I wanted to like do away with that. I just wanted to write a um, just like a hell ride from page one to page 169, <laughs> where you get on the train with this with this narrator, this unnamed narrator, um, and you just watch his whole world fall apart. Um, that was what I wanted to, to do. And I wanted to be, in a way, that capricious deity, right? I mean, I wanted to, you know, he's convinced that the universe has something in for him. As the creator of his universe, he, I will say he's not incorrect. <laughs> well, I was going to say, the universe does seem to have something in for this guy. And it really is a novel about somebody living on the margins and somebody who is just bottoming out. I mean, yeah. that's it. With this kind of blues soundtrack this blues it may have bottomed out i mean you know there's a you know obviously without spoiling anything there's a lot of you know he's unreliable and gets more unreliable as the book progresses there's a lot of open question right which i wanted to keep open you know what happened in his marriage as an example we don't ever exactly know there are a lot of hints we have a bunch of ideas um but hopefully it's a little ambiguous because i was really interested in um i mean this wasn't why but during the oj case um a friend of mine knew someone who knew OJ and they were having a conversation when, um, when, when all this was going on. And my friend said to this other person, he's, he's gotta be lying. And the guy who knew OJ said, he's not lying. He believes he didn't do it. The fact that he probably did it or certainly did it or whatever we want to say, doesn't have anything to do with whether he's telling what he thinks is the truth or not. He has created a mental construct in which he didn't do it. And that was so fascinating to me just as an idea. I wanted to play with a character who, you know, who had effectively eclipsed the specifics of his past in a certain sense for a variety of whatever the reason. So we're never quite sure. And then I think we're on a little bit of hopefully kind of unstable or unreliable footing from the beginning of the book as he kind of continues to disintegrate in a certain sense. Um, hopefully that amps up and is part of the part of what the movement of the book it, it involves. Okay. So... Uh, that trope, this kind of guy who's on the rocks making bad ch bad life choices, <laughs> that's very much like a noir trope. Exactly. And then another noir trope is the femme fatale. Yeah. And you kind of have a couple of those. You have two characters named uh, Karina, which is a blues reference, and yeah. Sylvia, who is Karina's like young stepmother. Right. And, and so... I wanted to... Well, I wanted to, that was a trope I wanted to play with because I wanted to, I didn't want to use the traditional femme fatale because I think that, I think it's, it, it's complicated and it's not really, it doesn't make for fully rounded characters. I mean, it's characters who are, I mean, some of them are, you know, I think, you know, in, in Chandler's work or Felix, Phyllis in, in Double Indemnity, they're, you know, they're complex characters. I wanted a character like that, but I wanted to put him in between these two characters, these two people. 
Um, originally, the idea was that, you know, there would be, you know, without spoiling anything, he gets involved in, or he gets in the middle of a situation between a stepmother and a stepdaughter who are having an inheritance dispute over the, the father's dead or the husband slash father's dead, and they're in, involved in an inheritance dispute. Um, he gets in the middle. I knew that, was, you know, early on as I was conceiving of this book, I knew that that was going to be the kind of um, the central conflict. And originally, my idea was just that he would choose wrong. He'd pick the wrong one. Um, and that sort of does resonate in, in the book, although it's changed in a lot of ways. But really, I wanted to write about him, or I wanted to have one aspect of the dynamic in the book be him projecting what he thinks those characters are, Karina and Sylvia, onto them that may or may not have anything to do with who they really are. And so, you know, for instance, um, neither of them functions exactly, I think, or I hope, like a traditional femme, uh, femme fatale in the sense that Sylvia's really toying with him in a lot. Like, does, she doesn't take him seriously um, until she needs something from him. And even then, she doesn't take him seriously. She just wants the information. She is the, you know, I, I'm, I think she's the kind of the driving uh, force at the center of the novel in a certain way. She's the one who's kind of making everything happen, and she's very clear-cut about what she wants and what she can do. Um, and that makes her a formidable adversary, and he is just, you know, he just kind of wanders in without any preparation, and, you know, she just, you know, she, he, she's, he's totally outclassed by her. So I wanted to play with, with that um, as well. I don't think any of them are, um, I mean, she's certainly his antagonist, I think, but I don't think any of them are like antagonists or protagonists. I also wanted to write about characters who had a lot going on. Um, and so, again, that act of projection on his part that act of assumption. Um, here's here's what here's what the situation is, and then I'll, you know, middle of the book, he realizes I got this completely wrong. That still complete that that idea really appeals to me because I'm very interested in how our perceptions often are um, inaccurate or are a reflection of what we want to see rather than what we are actually seeing. Sure. Yeah. No. And he, there's also, I mean, I don't think I would characterize this as a funny book, but there is a whiff of that to this guy in terms of how in over his head he is. You know, like, yeah, he's feckless. I mean, I hope there's some, like, like let's call it ironic humor. It's definitely not a comedy. <laughs> right, right. But I did, you know, there is, he is in over his head and he kind of knows it, but not really. And, you know, and he's definitely in a place, you know, he's drinking too much and he's, you know, he's, 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 he's feckless is the best word, uh, you know, I think um, I can come up with for him. Um, and he thinks he's smarter than he is, and all of a sudden he's up against a really smart adversary. I think in in her, and that you know he's as I said he's completely outclassed. Okay, so the and the basic setup, like from a real estate perspective, which is feels very much uh, rooted in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. is that you have this unnamed narrator living in a bungalow court, and for people who are not familiar with LA, I mean a bungalow court, it's usually like a a one-story apartment complex with like a few units and there's a courtyard in the middle. Yeah. And he lives in one of these in Hollywood, which is not for people listening who don't know Los Angeles, not the greatest area of Los Angeles. I mean, it's got all this kind of like, uh, you know, it's, there's all these associations with it in the popular consciousness, but the actual neighborhood of Hollywood is not a neighborhood to which Los Angelinos usually aspire to live in. Right. Uh, and I wanted to play with that too, obviously. Yeah, no, it's great. And as somebody who used to live in Hollywood, I mean, I, uh, you know, I loved it for that. And he lives across the courtyard from Karina, who is, I mean, we, we've kind of described Sylvia, who is the brains of the operation, but how would we describe Karina? Karina, I think of as, um, as a bit lost, right? So she's a character who's in her thirties. Um, she is no visible means of support. She's being, you know, she, her bills are being paid by you know, her father's estate. Um, that's one of the bones of contention with her, between her and her stepmother. Um, and so, you know, in, to me, she's a certain kind of, again, she's a certain, hopefully more three dimensional than that, but she's a certain kind of Hollywood or Los Angeles type, right? Which is a um, person perhaps on the fringes of the creative industry. Again, we never really know. Um, you know, living in a, in, in, um, in a, in a, in an apartment, you know, not a, not a fantastic apartment, but a, a nice enough apartment that someone else is, you know, that her family is helping her with or covering. Um, and again, also sort of adrift in the, in the middle of her life. And I think that that created for me between the two of them, the narrator and her, an interesting dynamic because 
he sees her for who she is. She, we're not in her head, so we don't know whether she sees him for who he is, although I think she probably does. Um, but he doesn't really see himself in her, and I think that they're kind of equivalent. You know, they're around the same age, few years difference. Um, and so I think they're both kind of lost souls or lost figures of the sort that there are often. I mean, you know, I, you know, one of the things I always, um, I mean, I'm this person too. I've always, you know, even when I had a, uh, you know, a straight job, I didn't have to go to work at 9 a.m. Um, or even when I've had those, I haven't had to go to work at 9 a.m. So I'm always intrigued by, you know, who's at the gym on like 11 on a Tuesday morning in, in Los Angeles or, you know, who's getting coffee and brunch. And it's not necessarily people who are making a ton of money, right? So, you know, they're both part. I wanted to really kind of evoke that sort of drifting just level below the surface of kind of, you know, Los Angeles and Hollywood, Hollywood life. Um, well, wait, I, I got to say, I feel like this is something that gets commented upon often by Los Angelinos. Like, what the fuck is everybody doing? Why is everyone, everyone is brunching on a Wednesday? What do these people do? That's a question I, that occurs I to me. I that myself, you yeah. know, because like as I said, I mean, I, I, I work mostly from home. At 11 on a Wednesday, I'm working. I'm sitting basically right here at this desk, you know, writing or doing whatever. So I wonder all about that. And so, you know, I mean, there is, you know, there's that scene at the very beginning or the like, early where she takes him out to breakfast at Dupar's in a farmer's market. And, you know, I mean, that's the kind of, that was the sort of, the vibe, but I didn't want to just leave it at that. I wanted to kind of explore those. I'm interested in pathologies and I wanted to explore the pathologies of both of those characters and how they would overlap or come together and cause chaos. Um, and so, you know, it's, it, it, I, I like stories where there's an agent of chaos in this narrative. I think we could say there are maybe three, maybe all three of the main characters are agents of chaos in their own way. Certainly, um, Karina is because she starts the whole ball rolling by, you know, she's, um, by going over to his apartment and engaging him in conversation and asking him to go see the mother. He himself, I think he thinks of himself as more of an agent of chaos, and certainly he creates an awful lot of chaos in the course of, of the novel. Um, and Sylvia, too, because Sylvia is chaos to him. Sylvia is not necessarily chaotic in her own world. She's very measured and controlled. But again, in that, that misreading of her, that misreading of the situation, she becomes an element of chaos or an unpredictable element in his life that, um, that creates trouble for him. Well, yeah, and this is definitely, I mean, just to kind of continue this real estate conversation we you know we've got the bungalow court and we've got the unnamed narrator and Karina living there in Hollywood and then you have Sylvia living in Benedict Canyon yeah up in the hills right. so this feels like a novel that is also about the stratification of wealth in Los Angeles and the implications of, of class wealth in Los Angeles I will say no one will ever pick it up but I'll say it here um, so people will hear like one of the reasons I chose Benedict Canyon she that house as I imagine and all these are imagined landscapes like I didn't go location scout for this I just kind of created but that house as I imagine it is just a little bit up the road from Cielo Drive so um, you know so there is which is a, a site of the Manson murders which is where yeah where Sharon Tate lived um, and so I wanted to kind of have that that dimensionality but yes I mean you know Los Angeles, like, it's interesting. There's this essay from the 1880s by Helen Hunt Jackson describing the city of Los Angeles, like 1884, 1885. And among the criteria or the kind of characteristics of the city that she identifies is the way wealth climbs the hill. So you have, you know, the kind of the, the working class, the workers, like in the flats in the city. And then even in 1885, when the population of the city is like, you know, 10,000 people or something like that, you know, as you go up the hill, there are, you know, there are the houses that are perched on the hill are bigger and, and more, um, more pointed. And so that, you know, I think it's, it's, it's the penthouse mentality, right? The, the, those who can, who are wealthy enough to separate themselves from the murk of the city, always go to higher ground and then that's great unless something happens like uh you know a massive wildfire and then you're stuck on your hillside or on your mountain and maybe you don't get off and it's uh, that's the other part of los angeles that i've always been deeply attracted to and have written about quite a lot like what happens when the elements just step in right or when you know you're living this this life that is you know a fantasy everywhere but particularly here in a sense because we're you know it's such an it's such a potentially inhospitable um, landscape for for us and then all of a sudden something happens and your you know your your readout your airy becomes vulnerable right and then it ends and things snap back to normal and we forget and so I really did want to play with um, Hollywood particularly that part of Hollywood which for those who know the city he lives um, in a bungalow court on Franklin, just down, you know, across the street or down you know, across the hill from the Magic Castle. 
And when he's wandering around Hollywood, he's wandering around, you know, um, like, you know, he goes to Musso and Frank, he's wandering around those areas. Like Holly, um, Hollywood Boulevard. Hollywood, which... Yeah, Hollywood Boulevard and, you know, and, and, and Selma and those, you know, and I wanted to get, again, that, that's the non-glamorous Hollywood, right? And so I really wanted to kind of create that geographic division between the kind of protected, isolated manor, let's say, where Sylvia lives up on the hill, um, and that kind of that roiling cityscape in which the other hit in which in which both Karina and the narrator um, live and to sort of trace both the similarities and different distant differences, excuse me, between the two, because the, you know, I mean, Sylvia is, or can be, or, you know, maybe a nefarious character in her own right. And so it's not that, you know, that protection doesn't, protect her from corruption in fact maybe it only adds to the corruption but the corruption is so neatly manicured you know um, with a fountain and the, the appointed lawns and all of that that was really fun to write to kind of invent that estate um that it is you know that it it, it kind of flips the dynamic a bit it, it turns it upside down well and there's also more than a whiff of madness in this novel like as a theme and as a recurring characteristic of the the narrator, possibly Sylvia, certainly Karina. I mean, the book opens with Karina screaming from across the courtyard, and this is a this is something that happens over and over again. Right, and it creates this ominous vibe and a sense of mystery. Like, why is she screaming? Mm -hmm. What is happening here? And then I think, coupled with that, there is. Uh, like kind of small brushstroke, you know, it's not, it's definitely, it doesn't dominate the narrative, but there is this element of the supernatural that you've woven into this story, which I, th <laughs> I found it to be a very interesting choice in a noir, but one that fits LA very well. You know, there is kind of like a mystical, weird, creepy, supernatural thing happening with these tulpas, which I would love yeah. to have you describe for uh, our listeners and to just maybe talk a little bit about that particular avenue and why you took it. Well, it's interesting. I it was that was a I have to say that was an instinctual move. I wrote a novel when I was in college um, as a senior thesis that included a Tulpa esque character. The novel was a mess um, and never advanced beyond like you know turning it into the thesis advisor stage. But I was really interested. And that also featured an unreliable narrator. So I should say, I've been interested in this kind of question of narrative reliability for a long time. But the Tulpa character in that book was an actual human being who was named Tulpa, whose parents had named her Tulpa um, because of their interest in um, Indian mysticism. And then the character had to decide whether she was real or not as he found out what Tulpas were. Um, the Tulpa, as, I, as it was first explained to me, and this is not what it is, but at that, at that time, that was one of the reasons I, anyway, as it was first explained to me, it was explained to me as a kind of mystical being, not physical, although with physical attributes, who um, monks and holy, of course they would be holy men, um, could dream into being to satisfy themselves, satisfy their urges without violating their vows of chastity. Right. Um, as someone who is deeply skeptical about all religion, I love this. I love the uh, the central irony of this idea. <laughs> um, I still love the central irony of, irony of this idea. But as I did research into what tulpas are, that's not what they are. I mean, that, that may be part of what they are, but they're they're bigger. And one of the key things, which is what happens in in this book, is they are definitely considered to be mystical beings who are summoned or even created by the person who summons them, but who then take on agency, and so they become a wild card. And, um, and I bring it up early, right? I bring it like, he knows what they are. He thinks about his, his, you know, he thinks about his first wife in those terms, um, a little bit early, early in the book. Um, and then it becomes much more of a thread in the second half of the book after he starts to slip the bounds of, of reason. And, um, and I don't, you know, I can't say exactly. It just seemed it just seemed right. I mean, as I was writing it, I didn't like, I didn't, you know, the parts where that becomes actual, I'm trying to really talk around spoiler stuff, but the parts where that becomes actualized and it does become a kind of a potentially supernatural or at least hallucinatory situation. Um, those were not part of the plan. Um, but as I was writing, you know, as you know, you write, you have a sort of idea of where you're going. And then as you're making the scenes, writing page to page, things start to emerge. And so that felt like it was a fruitful, um, 
lens through which to talk about his relationships with both of these characters and sort of their and who and questions of control I think so um, again I'm, I'm being really really vague and I'm, I apologize to listeners who are like what the hell is he talking about <laughs> but, but I found that that element was useful particularly because at the time it really emerges in the narrative he is really kind of in a territory where we he doesn't know what is he doesn't know whether he's coming or going in some way like things are really starting to kind of um snowball and so i thought that that was you know in in the moment as i was working it was like this is a way to amp that up this will really this will amp that up but it felt natural um in, in a way it wasn't like something that i imposed from the outside it emerged from the process of writing those those pages when i was drafting it must also feel like a kind of personal triumph for you to finally be able to effectively weave a tulpa into one of your books, unless you've done it before, and I'm not aware. After I've never done it before, and in fact, like I said, you know, I wrote that 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 first novel. I wrote. I graduated from college in 1984, so I wrote that um, a long time ago. I started writing this book in 2015, and then put it down for a while because I got my I wrote myself into a corner. I couldn't figure out how to get out of. But um, but that the tulpa emerged in that. For, I mean, she. I may be misremembering because I haven't read the book in a little bit, but I believe she emerges in the first chapter or, or the idea of the tulpa emerges in the first chapter. And I was as surprised as, you know, I was like, oh, I didn't see that coming. Okay, whatever. Let's see what happens. Um, and I think it was, yeah, I mean, there's definitely, for me, one of the thrills about this book is there are a few other components. I don't need to go into them, but there are a few other components that kind of echo, including the unreliable narrator, that echo that first book, that, you know, unpublished book. And so it does feel like a kind of, from a writer's point of view, it does feel a little bit like a closing of the circle, right? You know, this thing that I started and couldn't figure out, you know, wrote several drafts when I was like 22, 23, and, you know, ended up setting aside. Some of those ideas lingered and found a form that um, seemed cohesive and coherent. Sometimes it just takes a minute, you know? Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm a great believer in that. It's like, it's, it's, I, was, it, I was talking to students yesterday in class about it, and I said, you know, they were asking about time, and I was like, it takes how much time it takes. Sometimes they go really fast, and sometimes they take 40 years. <laughs> right, right. But you got to stick with it. And, you know, I want to talk about being a Los Angeles. I feel like you're very much a Los Angeles writer, and Los Angeles is one of your great subjects. Like, you're very deeply interested in this place historically. Uh, I think you have a lot of love for the city. Yeah. You can feel that coming through in your work. I think the last time we spoke, it was when you were um, out with your book on walking LA. I think that's right, yeah. So, and I'm a walker too. So I always resonated a lot with that one and with just the idea of walking around Los Angeles, which is not the most popular thing in the world right. to, to do. Uh, but there is something about this book for me as a, a, a denizen of this city that satisfied so many great curiosities and like pushed so many different like LA buttons for me. And we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier. It has to do with this kind of mystery of like, who, who are these people who live here, especially in a neighborhood like Hollywood, which, you know, as we've discussed, it can be a little seedy, maybe a little bit more mysterious in some ways. Uh, it's a, gr it can be gritty and, and there can be a lot of, overt human suffering on display Absolutely. in Hollywood. But then it's kind of meshed up against like somebody will have like a kind of newer model house that they've planted onto a lot. Yep. And there'll be like a Mercedes SUV in the driveway. And you're like, who, who is that person? Yeah. You know, who's decided to kind of put themselves there. So it's like, it's all just this big soup. And I have to believe that was part of what drew you into this material was an opportunity to kind of explore those questions. Like, who, who I mean, is Lee? What, what are the lives unfolding in this bungalow court? You know? Like, right. I mean, I wanted to make, I also wanted to make the city a character. Um, I mean, you know, it, it's, that can mean a whole bunch of different things, but I wanted Los Angeles to be very present. I wanted it to be like defining in a certain sense. Um, I'm not to say that this story couldn't happen anywhere else, but it happens here in a certain way that it wouldn't happen in another way. And I did, as we were talking about before, want to frame those kind of disparities between wealth and they're not, I mean, they're not living in poverty, but you know, wealth and, and lack of wealth, let's say, you know, wealth and, and, you know, and, and just squeaking by in, in whatever way. And so that, and, and I feel that in Los Angeles, well, in Southern California, that, that can become very, very pronounced because we see the the symbols of that wealth everywhere. It feels almost close enough for us to touch, but it belongs to somebody else. So, I mean, I remember when I first moved here, uh, we were looking for an apartment 
Um, it wasn't like looking for an apartment in New York where, you know, the first time you saw anything that was remotely acceptable, you jumped on it and hoped someone didn't, you know, make the, put down the deposit first. Here, at least when I moved here in 1991, there were plenty, like we were looking for a, you know, two bedroom duplex and there were plenty of, of them in our price range, but they all had problems. And we had a friend who lived here who was like, no, you can be picky here. You can be selective. I don't think that's necessarily true anymore here, but I remember it then. And there was too much choice. I was like, just somebody, you know, somebody make this choice. I can't, you know, I can't make this choice. And so I was really interested in how people end up places. This guy ends up in that bungalow court just because it's the first place he lands, right? He, you know, he, his marriage falls apart and he, you know, he buys all the, uh, the furniture in a day and moves into this apartment and just is like, fine, I don't want to worry about it anymore. And I kind of was interested in that. Um, Corinna's there for, um, for other reasons. But I wanted the city as it really is to be part of um, the book, as I have, I think, in the nonfiction books. I mean, there's so much mythology built around this city and so many kind of fantasies of what this city is and so many misperceptions that I wanted it to be very much about Los Angeles, but about Los Angeles, not about some idea of Los Angeles. So I think that in a lot of ways, the book, I had to live in Los Angeles for a long time to kind of be able to write the book because I needed to, I needed to have that experience of the, um, of the city. And so that's a big part of it, I think. Um, as far as the rest of it, let me see. I think, I think I may have just lost my train of thought. So, um, I'll, well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in because I think like this book touches on so many key aspects of living here that were like, you know, just instantly recognizable to me. And it does cover a lot of ground. You've got everything from the Beverly Hills Hotel to the Comedy Store to Dupar's, as we've discussed, the diner down at the uh, Farmer's Market. Neptune's to the, Net, that seafood. Uh, Neptune's that, Net, yeah, Magic Castle. Line. I was like, I'm put, you know, I didn't name it, but I was like, I'm putting that in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then there are also storylines that are like, like, kind of small bore storylines that are woven into the narrative. And I'm going to point to one in particular because it's really resonant with my experience of the city. And I, ha I hadn't thought about it in a minute, but it has to do with the, uh, the infamous arsonist of whatever year it was. Oh yeah. yeah. I don't know when that, when was that? Was that 2000? I don't even remember. It was like before eight or nine, something like eight or nine. Yeah. The guy who torched, you know, those he did, he like over like three or four nights, he torched like 40 cars. Okay, so yeah, for people listening who are either don't remember or not familiar, there was a stretch of time in Los Angeles when a guy went on an arson rampage and would go into garages, essentially, parking garages at apartment buildings and light cars on fire. This was when I was living in Hollywood. The first building that he torched was on my block. <laughs> okay. And he lived a block away from me, the guy who did it. So I very much, I remember walking up my street and the police tape and the burnt out car and the, you know, cause it was like, you know, LA's got these apartment buildings that are sort of on, they're raised up and there's like kind of a par open parking garage underneath. There's no gate. You just right. sort of drive underneath the building. And this is where he was hitting, you know, a lot of these uh, kinds of buildings. And it was really unsettling because you didn't know if your building was going to be next, you know, you yeah. didn't. Didn't know if you were going to have to wake up in the middle of the night and evacuate. And it was just so, what's the, very noir, this, this guy. Very, very much. And that too, I mean, I, he, that story comes in a couple of times. It comes in at the beginning. It's, it's woven. There are a few other mentions of it. Um, again, for me, I don't want to put too much consciousness behind it because a lot of it was just sort of what was in the atmosphere or my own inner atmosphere as I was writing. But I had been fascinated by that story. And Again, it's a particular kind of chaos. You know, where else but Los Angeles would a guy, you know, he's, okay, what am I going to do? I'm going to torch 40 cars. You know, where else would you find 40 cars? I mean, you, you know, you could, but there's something so interesting about the relationship of the car as a kind of mythic vehicle in the structure of the city that that decision to torch random automobiles in a parking garage takes on a whole other set of, of, of meanings in a place like, like Los Angeles. And the other thing I was going to say, I did finally, I stumbling back to my train of thought was, you know, what I always have been interested in, in terms of Los Angeles is what Mike Davis called the sunshine noir dialectic, which is that, you know, in a place like this, which is aspirational, whatever else it is, it is aspirational. And you have 
a group of people, not all of the people, but a group of people who are coming here for some kind of aspiration, um, if you don't get it, if you don't succeed, then noir kicks in pretty quickly, right? You know, I mean, the, 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 you know, the myth is that you're not going to be able to go home. You're not going to go home with your tail between your legs or whatever, whatever you want to say. You know, so you're stuck. And so I'm always interested. I think that in a certain sense, that's what makes, for me, Los Angeles such a fascinating noir city, is that in a certain sense, it's kind of paradisal promises, you know, um, if they're inverted, lead to a particularly nasty kind of noir sensibility because you are lost and a far, long, long way from home and there's no way to get back. And I don't know that that's, I mean, I think it's true, it can be true in other places, but I think it's a, a hallmark of a certain strata of Los Angeles life. And I was really interested in looking at that. Well, and it's also a city where it's easy to be invisible. I guess it's, you know, you could say the same thing about a lot of big cities, but LA, and I think LA in particular has been written about in this way. It's an easy city. It's a good city to disappear in. Yeah. And that's kind of what this guy, the unnamed narrator of your book, has been up to. He, he aspires to do that until he, until he gets himself into a situation where he can't. You know, but yes, I think his entire, and I like that idea. I mean, I was drawn by that too. Like I, you know, I like books about characters who are aspirational and want to like do great things. But I also like books about characters who just want to sit in a room for the rest of their lives and never talk to anybody again. Um, you know, and so I was like, well, I'm going to spend that. That um, I will spend some time with with this kind of character. I want to see how this how this guy ticks. I want to see what, what makes him work. Well, we know Maker's Mark makes him work. <laughs> yeah, Maker's Mark. We know Maker's Mark. <laughs> uh, but it's, it, the other thing I want to uh, touch upon is, like, there's the wildfire aspect, which is another kind of unmovable uh, element of life in this region and in this city. Like, we, we're kind of in the middle of wildfire season now. Nothing, knock on wood, has happened. Yeah. Uh, so far, but you live with that when you live in a place. I mean, I guess you, you live with that in a lot of places these days, but California in particular yeah. uh, sees a lot of this stuff. And you also set this book, I believe it's the end of July. So it's just yeah. peak, peak heat peak where heat. LA is just kind of sweltering and the tension is ratcheting up. So that's, that felt like a very deliberate choice. That was a deliberate choice. Absolutely. I also, I mean, I think I say it in the book early, but I have always, I mean, I know we're in wildfire season now, but I've always found summer to be the most terrifying. I mean, I love summer, but I mean, in terms of the wildfires, my kids went to summer camp in Idlewild and, you know, they were evacuated a few times once we had to drive out to, you know, Hammett High School where they'd established an evacuation site and pick our daughter up, you know, like two in the morning on a, when, once they got off the mountain. And so um, I've always been aware of summer as, um, as dry and dangerous and so and the heat especially in July because you know again without I didn't want to obviously code all this into the book but you know June you have June gloom and then July it really kicks in and those you know those days where um, you know you get up on the, in the morning and you know seven in the morning and it's already 98 degrees like that was <laughs> I wanted that to be the atmosphere I was gonna say if you're gonna go noir that's a good choice you know it's like it's it's, it's not the winter here. It's not. Yeah. Uh, it's not like the fall and everything's dying. It's it's yeah. the peak of of summer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So all of that because I do think that you know I I'm always interested in atmosphere. I'm always interested in weather. I'm always interested in um, social weather too. I'm always interested in kind of how the circumstance in which the story is taking place affects what happens in the story by virtue of how people have to respond to all of those other exterior elements. And so the wildfire becomes, well, useful for a variety of reasons, but in terms of its presence, and it becomes a big wildfire, so it's threatening large parts of the city. Um, I also wanted, I mean, as I think I said at the beginning, I wanted to write a book that was an existential thriller. Part of the existential question, or one of the existential questions in the book, is the existential question of the city itself. And so I, you know, I, 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 wanted it to be something that lingered. I didn't want it to be an earthquake because that would be, you know, it, it can be, ca it's catastrophic also, but there's the, <clears throat> the, the jolt and then it's the aftermath. Um, the same, I think, with flooding in a certain way. Drought is more of an ongoing, like a chronic illness, let's say. But wildfire, especially a big wildfire threatening neighborhoods is acute. And so, and we all know from having lived through it, you know, you're paying attention to the wind and what's the, you know, if, if there's Santa Ana conditions, when are they going to die down and how much of the fire is contained? Like we all know this language of, you know, of fire, wildfire and wildfire containment and all of that. So that seemed also like a rich territory to kind of um, explore, as I say, to kind of 
amp up the stakes, but also to look into the existential question of Los Angeles itself. And then to kind of can continue a little bit more with your narrator and his unreliability, a question that arises for me, like has to do with like the rules that you maybe set for yourself as you're writing him. I doubt it was that explicit, but you do have to kind of abide by some kind of code to maintain that unreliability, but to also make sure that your narrator is not so unreliable as to render their narrative uh, incohesive. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, what does it take to write an unreliable narrator? Was it just a matter of feel and intuition, or did you really sit down and like draw out? I didn't sit down and draw out. It was partly feel and intuition, but to say it was only feel and intuition is to minimize um, what it was. As I, you know, I, <clears throat> I'm drawn to unreliable narrator. I actually would argue if we were having a, a critical conversation that all, all, all narrators are unreliable because all narrators have an agenda. So they're telling, um, they're telling their story for a particular reason, which renders them unreliable. Um, and so, which I think is actually great. I mean, I embrace that as a, as a narrator and I think about it when I'm, you know, when I'm writing essays or nonfiction, I'm telling you what I see or what I think, but I could have it totally wrong. Um, and I, I want that kind of conditionality or that, that sense of my own, um, imposition of meaning, let's say that, that it's, it, you know, um, I, I want that to be part of the writing here. It was similar. Um, but the challenge, and I really did like one of the, one of the things I wanted to do with this book was to write a convincing, unreliable narrator or, or watch, how would I put it? Not that he's not that he's unreliable exactly, but convincingly trace his descent into madness. Okay, and so what I ended up realizing because I've read a lot of I mean I, there are a lot of models and you know books that I've read. I mean Marceau and the Stranger is, is a is a clear example. But um, what I wanted was for his unreliability or his madness to make sense. So it's not just. When I was in high school, I took a class, an English a writing class, where we read a bunch of Edward Lear and Lewis Carroll, and we were asked to write nonsense verses. And everyone, myself included, just was like, great, there are no rules, we'll just do this. And we wrote these terrible nonsense verses, and our teacher was like, no, it has to have an internal logic. It can't just be like whatever crazy idea popped into your head. You need to have an internal logic that is, that is nonsensical, and then build a sensical narrative or structure around that nonsensical center. And so um, that may be the only thing I remember from high school. <laughs> <laughs> but again, it came in handy. I mean, it stuck with me. And so what I was really, once I started writing it, I was really interested in, well, first I was really interested in how far can I push this and still make it work and not make him alienating in some way um, or make him just alienating enough or not too alienating, you know, not, you won't run away from him. But I also was really aware of the fact that if he was going to descend into madness, as I wanted him to do, that that madness would have a structure and it would have a, um, and I'm, you know, it would have a shape and it would have a logic, an internal logic of its own. So I hope that's what happens. I, if, you know, if that, that was definitely something I was conscious of. It wasn't just making um, decisions that illustrated that he had slipped the bounds of logic. It was making decisions that had their own or <clears throat> actions that had their own interior logic that added up, even though we could recognize it as readers as a logic that was I illogical in a certain way. Yeah, like you got to make him believably nuts. Exactly. And exactly. it's got and it's got to, and it escalates. You know, it's not something yeah. that's static throughout the novel. It, it it ratchets up as you go. And another thing that I admire about this book is its plotting, and. You know, noir plots usually are, there is kind of like an elegant simplicity to them when they are done well, I feel like. It's not really like Byzantine and like gnarled and complicated. It's usually like a simple setup. Yeah. You got a guy, razor, right? Right. It's like we got a guy in a bungalow court living across from a woman who screams on a regular basis. He gets entangled with her, entangled with her stepmother, gets in the middle of their inheritance dispute. And hilarity ensues. And hilarity ensues. And so, I'm I'm curious to know how you landed on that because I love when I'm reading a book that feels elegantly plotted in that way where it's like, oh yeah, simple, clean. Like you can build a whole novel out of something that something isn't really small. Yeah. And so I think, you know, this, you know, again, I wanted to, I mean, those, you know, there are those convoluted noir plots where, you know, then, you know, a hundred pages before the end, there's a whole new twist and some other body shows up and then there's a serial killer. And then like, I wanted to avoid all of that stuff. 
Um, that was one of the reasons too that I wanted the book to be really short, you know. But I also because I didn't, I want, I wanted it to, like I said, I just wanted it to be just, you know, a, a just a a ride from beginning to end. Um, as far as plotting, I didn't really like. I don't outline or take notes. I mean, I have a lot of ideas and things. A lot of it, as I said, comes out of the writing. I knew that, you know, I knew what the shape of, let's say, the early chapters was going to be. He was going to meet. Corinna, she was going to talk to him about going up the hill to talk to Sylvia. He was going to go up there. He was going to have an unsatisfying conversation and he was going to report back to Corinna and she was going to ask him to go up again. Um, so that's like the first three or four chapters. And, you know, there's other stuff obviously that happens there, but that was kind of the narrative frame. I think the, sh the frame was, was tight. What, you know, as I, I, you know, I wrote the first 74 pages in the summer of 2015 I believe I, I look back and check the dates. I believe I began this book on maybe the exact day that Donald Trump came down the, the gold, uh, <laughs> gold escalator of Trump power, um, which is <laughs> perfect time. Short, perfect time to start short. an existential noir, right? Right. So, um, and then, like I said, I wrote, I got my, I got, I, I, because I wasn't, I didn't have an external plot structure. And I, I mean, I write fiction, but I write short fiction. I, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't tried to write a novel in, in decades. So, um, and my short fiction is very much, very, like, very episodic. It's just like, you know, here's an episode, right? You know, it's, it's very slice of life. It takes place usually in real time. You know, this story is 15 pages long. It, it's 15 minutes of this person's life or half an hour of this person's life, you know. So that, I kind of managed to avoid plotting throughout my writing, um, writing life. But I did, you know, I stopped on page 74 because I got the character into a place where I couldn't figure out how to get him out. Um, I put the book down. A bunch of other things happened. You know, Sidewalking came out. Um, I left the LA Times. I started teaching at USC. Um, I, you know, I, I did some other books. I, you know, the pandemic hit, etc. I was working on a memoir. Um, and then when the pandemic hit, I realized I couldn't work on the memoir anymore. I had always wanted to go back to those pages. I had liked the pages that I had of the novel, but I didn't know what to do. And I, I had notes, but I didn't know what to do with it. I um, was working on this memoir, and pretty early on during lockdown, I realized I couldn't work on the memoir because everything, I couldn't work, I couldn't do memory work. Everything was so present tense. It just didn't make, I couldn't get myself into that headspace. So I was like, all right, this is the perfect opportunity to read these pages. And I read them, and two things happened. One was, I was like, oh, it's a book about isolation. Like, perfect, you know? Right. In some way, like, I'm, you know, I'm living in this mode right now. I can actually do some things that reflect on this without making it a book about the pandemic, because I did not want to write, I mean, I was writing essays about the pandemic, but I definitely didn't want this to be a pandemic book. Although there are elements of, like, contagion and, you know, viral stuff is, like, it comes up as a kind of motif. But um, as I was reading it, I was like, oh, I could do this. And that turn opened up the rest of the novel, opened up the second half of the novel. And so again, without specific... Wait, what turn? What turn? I want to say. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but there was a turn, there's a turn in the middle of the novel that opened it up for me and really opened up the, the second half of the novel. Um, I just don't want to, I don't want, I, I'm conscious of the spoiler. Um, but that, realizing that moment that I could do what I needed to do opened up the rest of the book. It wasn't like I went down and outlined the back end of the book, but it just created a momentum. And then I was just writing every day. And so my process really, when I'm writing long form, when it's rolling is I try to write for, you know, three or four hours a day. If I can do it, I'll write less if that's what I have available to me. But there was a lot, you know, I had some time during the lockdown. Um, and I always start every day by rereading the last couple of days pages and, you know, messing around with it. And so it felt like I was, you know, over, I, it took about four and a half months to finish it, to write like the last hundred pages. And it felt like I was living in kind of daily proximity with the characters and the narrative because I was spending so much time with them and trying to tell the story that I just felt like, you know, it was just keeping my eyes open and kind of recording what was happening. I don't know how else, it sounds, it's, it sounds less work than it was in that way but it, it you know it's not like it was a mystical process but it was really just me <clears throat> paying attention to how the how the narrative was unfolding and so there are a lot of wild cards right i mean there's you know the neptune's net thing came out that's at the towards the end of the book that that um i didn't know i was going to do that until i was right there you know a lot of that detail work emerged in the daily writing but i had a sense of what the shape of it was going to be i knew where it was going to end at that point like i knew what the end was going to be so i could write i could write to that end so Speaking of writing to the end of a book like this, existential noir, uh, 
it's, it's about the darkness, right? And it's about a person kind of on his way down and coming apart uh, mentally. Mm -hmm. Like, obviously, this is not a reflection of you uh, personally, but I'm curious to know, like, having written this book, like, seen a story like this through, like, what is the after effect? What's the, how does it feel? <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? To get a book like this done, does it put you in, I mean, it puts you in a good mood? Like, yeah, you realized your vision, you've written a, a good noir novel, it's out there in print, but just from like a worldview standpoint, do you, do you know what I'm getting at? Like, I do, I do. I mean, so first of all, as it's always great to finish a book, you know, I mean, no matter what, like just to finish, even if it doesn't come, I mean, you know, there was a period cause I wrote, you, you know, I've done mostly nonfiction. So we've, you know, I've sold books on proposals or sample chapters or things like that. And then written the, you know, signed a contract and written the book, this book as you know, novels, you write them and then try to sell them. So, as I was writing it, I, you know, that was a, that was an interesting departure for me. Also, I had not written a book that I hadn't pre-sold. Um, I liked it. Um, and felt that it gave me a lot of freedom. Um, but so I was, you know, there are two things. One was, I want to finish a book that is satisfying to me. And then I would like to see if we can make the book come out. One of the interesting takeaways was that when I finished the book, I was very firmly aware of the idea that if the book didn't sell, I would be okay with that because I felt like that the book itself, the writing of the book had been its own reward. I mean, obviously I wanted the book to come out, but I w it wouldn't, I wouldn't have felt that the book was a failure if it hadn't um, sold. And that, that's just an interesting territory for me as a human and also as a writer and, and a territory I kind of want to um, continue to sort of exist in, in some way it removes some of that um, commercial pressure or, or, um, or, or sales pressure or whatever it is, right. Publication pressure. Um, but you know, uh, the, the place where I am similar to this character, I mean, so two other things I want to say. One is the other thing that I really enjoyed was writing about a character who isn't like me. We have a bunch of things in common, the, the love of the music, etc. cetera. Um, but I was, you know, as after all these years of writing first person nonfiction about myself or about, you know, some stand, some, some, you know, literary stand in for me on the page. It was really great to write about a character who wasn't me. And it, you know, I was like, this is free. I'm, this is liberating. But the other thing, the thing I do share with him in addition to his love of the music is that kind of existential sensibility, that kind of bleakness. I mean, I don't think that I, I don't think that we live in a malevolent universe, although I have, but I certainly think we live in an indifferent, at best an indifferent universe. Um, and I don't think there's, I don't think there's any, I mean, I, I don't think there's any reason why we're here. I don't think there's any, I don't think we come back. I don't think there's anything after this. I think this is a huge cos cosmic accident in some way. Um, I think that there are, it's one of the reasons I align with the exist, the French existentialists, the absurdists, um, you know, when Camus says in myth of Sisyphus, we must imagine Sisyphus happy. And then he makes the argument that, you know, meaning is what we make of it. So in a universe that has no inherent meaning, it is our moral responsibility to create meaning and to do good, to be good. I love that because it means that the responsibility is mine. I'm not doing anything because I'm expecting a reward after I die. Right. I'm doing it now because I'm expecting to, to, I'm expecting to like flame out when I die. So, um, <laughs> so there is that. So I really want it. And I've explored those questions in my nonfiction too, but I really wanted to explore. There have been moments in my life when it had been like direly all consuming, particularly when I was younger, where like those thoughts were terrifying and, um, and made me, not just scared, but angry in a certain way. Like I didn't ask for, you know, there's a, you know, born never asked all that, you know, all those things. Right. So I wanted to really explore that sense of that sensibility from the inside too. It makes him go mad. And I keep using the word mad because I'm thinking about it madness in that kind of, you know, old school way, as opposed to, you know, the, the way we now think about, um, mental health and, but like really it, it, it you know, it, it, you know, he's going to Arkham Asylum or something, right. It makes him, it creates madness. Um, and so from the point of view of someone who has experienced some of that existential madness and still has, you know, I mean, you know, I still get the, you know, the 3 a.m. heebie-jeebies on a pretty regular basis. <laughs> um, I wanted to explore that in some way. And so this character became a really interesting vehicle for me to do that. Um, I also wanted to explore the question of what happens... Right. So Robert Stone, as an example, in some of his stories, writes, you know, talks about, and he's talked about this in interviews too, 
his idea, he was Catholic and he believed that, you know, he believed in God, but he believed that God had abandoned, had made the universe and then abandoned the universe. And I really liked that idea. So I wanted to weave some of those things in. So, you know, there, and, and also this question too, of what happens if God is mad? What happens if God is unstable? You know, what happens if God is unreliable? Um, which I mean, why not? It's as, it's as possible as anything else. So I wanted to kind of bring all of those kind of wild cards into um, into the book, both as the condition of his mental state, the narrator's mental state, but also because I think about that stuff all the time, and I wanted to kind of explore it in narrative rather than in um, in analysis. Let's say. Yeah, I mean, I do you ever like? Is it ever the thought ever occur to you that like maybe this is some sort of hell realm? I know that's yeah. a, cheer, a cheery thought, but I'm, sometimes I look around and I'm like. Maybe that's what this is. Maybe it's not like the fire and brimstone hell of popular imagination, but maybe it's some sort of middle middle ground hell where people are just not doing that great, not that happy. It, yeah, I mean, I think it's all, it, it's definitely possible. And I mean, I, you know, like, I'll just say, like, I, I enjoy my life. I, you know, knock on wood. Um, and, you know, and I've been really, really lucky and I appreciate it. But I also feel like, you know, I am this mortal being and... I'm aware of that always. I mean, since I was a little kid, I've been aware of that. And so that it's all temporary. And so that question of, you know, how, how do we have meaning? What is meaning in a world where everything disappears? And everything. I mean, that's why I'm, a, you know, I'm, I'm obsessed with the La Brea Tar Pits because they are both, the, you know, the kitschiest, you know, hokiest tourist attraction in the whole city of Los Angeles and the realest thing in the entire city of Los Angeles, right? Because the Which, tars, can, you, can we describe what they are for people who don't yeah, know? Yeah, they're big tar pit. They're big. So they were actually excavated about like, 1909, 1910. 1913 um, as asphalt mines, but they sit uh, next to the LA County Museum and near the Page uh, Archaeological Museum, literally 100 yards off Wilshire Boulevard, which is the main commercial street of much of Los Angeles. And they are big tar pits where fossils get pulled out of. Um, they have these, um, they're not plaster of Paris, but I always think of them as plaster of Paris, these giant mammoths sitting standing at, at the edge of a tar lake with you know one of the mammoths is in the tar lake being sucked down and the other two are trumpeting um at, at the danger that's the kitschy part but the fact that you know on right off of this commercial street this absolutely pre present tense 21st century commercial street um is this big pool of tar that that you know that archaeologists are are pulling or paleontologists are pulling fossils out of skeletons and fossils of you know animals that have been dead for ten thousand years? Um, it's pretty sobering. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, that's perspective giving. It's good yeah. in a way, you know. And it is a it, it's an odd thing to have sitting in the middle of the city. It really is, you know, and I walk by, it's like, in, I, I live in that neighborhood, so I, you know, it's part of my, one of my, I have a few different walking loops, and it's part of one of them, so I walk by it all the time, um, and think about it, but I do think, like, so I wanted, you know, I really wanted to kind of address that question of existential ephemerality, or existential uncertainty, um, and, 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 and then use that as part of what I think creates his internal weather. Okay. So you just mentioned walking. I have to ask, I know you're a walker. You're still walking. Like this All is, time. Yeah. what, like, what does your routine look like? I get up in the morning. Well, I mean, you know, I, I, I like to do it in the morning cause I'm tired at the end of the day and it allows me to actually organize my head. So I, it's a physical function and it's also a meditative function. I usually walk for about an hour. I get up at like six 30 and I walk for about an hour and a half till like six 30 to eight or six 45 to eight 15. Um, and I walk either through, I either walk through that area up by the tar pits and and, um, and the county museum, or uh, conversely, I'll walk uh, the other direction to you know through Beverly Hills and back around. So because I live in basically I live mid city, mid Wilshire. So um, and what it does for me is. Well, it's changed a little bit now. I'll get to that in a second. What it does for me is it allows me to, like, I sort of go through what the day is going to be. I don't listen to podcasts. I don't, I do that in, at home, but like I'm walking, I just, I want the space in my head. I don't go with anybody else. I don't talk to anybody. Um, and I just kind of walk and sort of settle. And if I'm working, like when I was working on this book or when I'm working on any book, but when I was working on this book, I was always taking notes on my phone. 
Um, so you'd see me, this solitary walker, like typing notes on my phone um, because something would come up. You know, I'd be like, oh, perfect. You know, there's something about that repetitive physical movement that kind of settles you into whatever it is, the alpha wave, the beta wave, whatever the waves are. Um, I once read an article about this, so I'm talking completely out of, off my top of my head, but I, I like this idea also. Um, and then I come home and, you know, and get to work. So it's kind of a settling thing. Lately, uh, over the summer, I bought this box of instruction cards. I'm really interested in books of instruction and things like that called Oblique Strategies, which was created in the early 1980s by Brian Eno and a, a visual artist named Peter Schmidt. And they're just instructions, like 100 plus cards. So what I've been doing like for the last few months is I draw a card at random every morning and see if that, see if it, pro and they don't always, but sometimes it's a good prompt, you know, um, whether for the, for what I'm working on or if it's some issue I'm dealing with, you know, in, not in work in my actual life or my, you know, my personal life. Um, so I play with it, but I use it as both the physical exercise is really, really useful for me just in terms of like calming things down and, um, and the, the kind of, um, the kind of meditative process of it, which is not at all what I was expecting because that was not part of my walking life before I started doing these walks. It really came, I mean, I was doing it a lot anyway, but really during the pandemic, I started walking er really early because I wanted to avoid people. And then I found that I like being up early, um, which is a stunning thing. Um, so like, <laughs> my inner 19 year old is, what are you, you're getting up at 630? That's when we go to bed. <laughs> but um, I like being up early and I just felt like it really ground, it, it really grounds me. So I walk, mo not every day, most days. Well, in an hour and a half, is a, that's a good walk. That's like, what, six miles about. Something like that, yeah. And it, uh, I feel like, because I'm a walker too, and I feel like you, you sort of have to give yourself that time. You have to give yourself enough time to sort of cut through the the static of your brain and to let yourself fall into whatever those brain waves are. You know, it's it it yeah. usually most days it takes a while. Some days it takes maybe the whole time, you know, to to get there. But uh I relate to that. And it's also good for your physical health, you know, to take a good well, long walk. Well, definitely that, which I mean, I feel better. But also it's like, you know, I this is not to sidetrack, but you know, like I'm dealing among other things I'm dealing with um I've got aging and infirm parents who live in New York and I go see them. And last time I was there, I found myself walking. I, I walk in Central Park, but I, I was walking and I found myself writing poems on my phone about the experience of being there, like little sort of impressionistic poems. Not that I'm necessarily going to do anything with those poems, but that process too is really useful in terms of grounding me to go back into their house and be able to take care of whatever I needed to take care of. So sometimes it's directed like that. That wasn't like an intention of mine. It just sort of emerged Sometimes it's more general or more generic, but I do think there's something about the kind of grounding yourself in your body, um, or for me at least, grounding myself in my body before I have to do whatever it is I'm going to do that day. Okay, so I also want to ask you about your professional trajectory and background. It's interesting to me that you worked for a number of years as a book critic, like the chief book critic of the LA Times. You edited the book review and then you made this pivot, as you were saying earlier, around 2015, was that right? Yeah. Where you left the Times and kind of set off, you're teaching at USC, you're doing these different things, but namely you're writing and you're writing fiction. You know, you wrote this novel. I'm curious how you conceive of the relationship between the work that you have done and continue to do to some extent as a critic and the work that you do on your own writing. They have to inform one another. Yeah. And I'm just wondering about that part of it for you? They definitely inform one another. When I started, I didn't start as a critic with a, I mean, I like, I, let me just backtrack on that. I love book criticism. I love book reviews. I've read them my whole life. You know, I started reading the New York Times book review when I was like 10 or 11 years old. And I loved the fact then and still do that they were using, um, they were using critics, but they were also using novelists and other writers. You know, I was reading, um, you know, I could read Philip Roth on Milan Kundera or something like that, or, or, you know, and so I, it started, it, it intrigued me because when I, I wanted to be a writer from really, really early on, like seven or eight, 
But I didn't have any idea what that meant. And as I kind of started to come into a writer's sensibility, which again, I did early, I started to realize things. So, uh, you know, I would have never suspected that there could be that overlap between, let's say, a creative writer and a critical writer. Now I see it all as creative writing, but I'll get to that in a minute. So I would have never thought that there would be an overlap between a creative writer and a critical writer. So as I started reading in that way, I started realizing like, oh, this is, you know, you can like, it's a multi it's a, it's a multi-hued career, right? It, it, it's a multi, there's a lot, there's stuff going on in different areas. And that really appealed to me and it still appeals to me. I mean, I get bored really easily. I like doing a lot of different things. Um, I like being in a lot of different conversations and I see it all as, as conversation and I see it all as kind of the parts of a coherent whole in some way. So the criticism, when I first started writing it, I was writing it very much as a, a writer rather than a critic and trying to show off my chops, which I had a few really good editors early on who cured me of, of that, that mistake. And, um, but I also realized that I, two things, I, I liked being in the conversation with readers about books. Like I liked being able to write a review and then have the readers, you know, I, you know, whether they wrote to me or not, read it and respond to it or whatever. Like we were talking about stuff that was coming out right now. And also that if I was going to be a success, I, I, well, let's say if I was gonna be a credible critic, I had to think about my own aesthetic. I couldn't just be writing off the cuff. I had to think about, you know, the books that I was reading, you know, A, not only, I like, judge, ref, ref, write about them on their own terms, but also think about what they're telling me about what matters to me as a writer, what my aesthetic value system is. And that was really, really useful and I loved it and I still do. So, um, so that was one thing. And then I could apply and did that sort of aesthetic knowledge or that aesthetic sensibility or that sense of an aesthetic sensibility to my fiction or to my nonfiction, my creative writing. Um, and then I became a teacher because I was teaching the whole time I was at the, the, I taught before I was at the Times and then I was teaching the whole time I was at the Times or most of the time I was at the Times as well. Um, and that became another kind of element in that conversation because a lot of what I had been developing in terms of a critical uh, or aesthetic sensibility as a critic, I was then applying in the classroom to talking about the work that we were reading and talking about the, with the students about their work. And there's also a kind of critical mass that happens when you're working um, editorially like that. Because I often think of, you know, when teaching writing, you're actually working in a kind of an editorial function that um, allows you, you know, it, it all kind of bleeds. Like I start to think about my own work through the lens of what I'm seeing in their work. So all of those things are talking to each other. Um, and I never really saw them as distinct in any way. Um, I've given a lot of lectures lately about the idea that, you know, creative writing is uh, sorry, critical writing is creative writing, right? You're coming up with a narrative of ideas rather than a narrative of action or a narrative of character, but you are still, you know, it's still subjective. You're still approaching it from a certain angle. You're making an argument or asking certain questions, which you would be doing in a piece of fiction or in an essay or a poem or any of those things. So I've kind of dropped uh, or tried to drop away all of those distinctions, at least in my own head, in between what, what the various forms of writing are, and even the various forms of, let's say, literary production or literary involvement, editing, teaching, um, you know, advocating, things like that. Um, I wanted to, it, it all feels like, it feels like a series of, I keep using this word conversation because I don't know a better one, but it feels like a series of overlapping conversations that I'm having with <clears throat> myself and my own work, but also with my, you know, my students, with readers, with the writers I'm editing because I'm still editing, um, I'm still editing. So it, I, it just, it feels like it enlarges the world. Yeah, well, I like the word conversation because whether you're working in a kind of like monkish way where like writing books is all you do and it's just you and the work. You know, there are very few people who are like that, but I suppose there are a few. Uh, you're still, at least theoretically, trying to have a conversation with the reader. Yeah. You're, it, it's trying to communicate. I think that can kind of get lost sometimes. And I feel like doing things the way that you do them, where you're involved in all these different aspects of the process and with all these different readers and people who are at different stages of the process that feels natural to me and like recognizable to me. And it seems like the kind of thing that would probably be useful to most people. I don't know how many people really thrive working in a total vacuum, despite the way that it can be romanticized. I think so too. And I mean, I don't know. And I'm also, I don't know about you, but I tend to work most efficiently when I have a lot of things to do. When I have like all day to write, I 
sit around and fuck or fuck off for hours, you know? Right. Um, right. And sometimes that's really important and useful too. But I, I feel like it's the days where I'm like, all right, I'm teaching at one and I've got to get this done. And like, you know, I just like, there's something, there's something, there's a clarifying element to that. And, um, and that's really helpful. That's really helpful to me. Um, I also want to say, you know, I was a little bit of a slow starter in the sense that, I mean, I was writing, but in terms of getting work out into the world, I was, you know, really late twenties before I started publishing anything. Um, and into my thirties before I actually was like, actually, you know, actually able to approximate making a living. So I, you know, I got a lot of no's. And so I just tend to say, you know, if you say yes, I almost always say yes, because I feel like, you know, I, it's just a, if it's something I want to do, I will figure out a way to make time to do it because the, to be presented with an opportunity that's exciting and not do it seems to me to be going back to that existential question. It seems to me to be a waste. Right. So, um, so I'll, I'll do it, but I do think like the carving out the space for the writing is really, really important. I mean, what's interesting is over the summer I was trying to work on a couple of things and I was getting nowhere and I knew I had to make a decision about which one of them I was going to work on, but I wasn't there yet. And, um, I pulled one of those oblique strategies cards and it, the, the, the prompt was think about the order in which you do things. And I was like, okay, that's really useful. And I was like, all right, so that, you know, the way I took that was like, pick the project and front load that, right? Do that. That's your, you know, if you, that's your two hours in the morning before you do the other work. Don't save that for the end of the day when you're tired, you know? And so I've been doing that the last, um, the last couple months on this, this other book that I'm working on. And it's been kind of eye opening in the sense of just front loading it so often, so many of my books were written that way without me even like planning it, you know, lost art of reading was written when I was still book editor of the LA times. So I was going into the office. So I would get up at like six in the morning and write for two hours and then, you know, have breakfast, get dressed and drive down to the paper. And I think there's, you know, for me, it's, a way of it gives me enough time for immersion <clears throat> if it's a daily or almost daily practice the conversation is continuous um but i also like the fact that it's there it, it takes some of the pressure off because i'm like all right i'm gonna sit here for two hours and then i have to go do something else so even if it's going badly it's only two hours and if it's going well then <clears throat> i leave it with a little bit of enthusiasm for the next day so are you working on more fiction, more noir? Is this something you're going to continue to write? Like, what's the next project? I, you know, the next project is a nonfiction, is the, is the nonfiction book, the memory book. I don't love the word memoir, so I'm just going to call, I'll just call it the memory book that I was working on at the beginning of the pandemic that I put down. So I've returned to that. So that's the, ne that'll be, that's the next thing, I, I, I think. I mean, unless something else rears its head, but that's the thing I'm kind of burning, I'm cooking on right now. Um, as far as more n novels or more noir, I don't know. I mean, to tell you the truth, I don't, I don't think that programmatically. I have a few other book ideas that I want to work on. Um, after this, I'm writing a short story. I'm writing a noir short story. So that, that is, um, for an anthology. So that's something that that's happening. So I'm keeping my hand in. I might write another, I might write another novel. I might write another novel that's not a noir novel. I, I'm not sure yet. One of the things I wanted to do with this book too was I wanted it to, I was very conscious of wanting to create a book that was a standalone. I did not want to have, um, I didn't want to have a series character. You know, I, I, I didn't want to. A, want to a, the, ser a series character. Yeah. I didn't want to have the temptation to go back because um, I don't really like going back. I don't, I, I don't really revisit things. So um, I didn't want to make it easy for myself to go back. So I wanted to write a book about a character who like the book ends, you know, like my journey with that character ends on the last page of the book. Okay. Well, I got to ask, do you have these, uh, what do you call it? Oblique strategies? Are they nearby? Can we read one yeah. aloud for the, for listeners? Let's see if we can give people oh, a prompt. Here's, here's, here's the box. <laughs> okay. Oops. Right. It's a nice nifty little item. Here's the names, Brian Eno and, uh, and Peter Smith. And what I've been doing is drawing off the bottom of the deck, um, like the card sheet that I am. So let me deal off the bottom of the deck. <laughs> All right. Beautiful. <laughs> and today's bottom of the deck is, I'll show it to you, but it, it reads not building a wall, but making a brick. So wait, that's, hang on, there we go. There it is. Um, and so there are all these little prompts like that. You know, sometimes there's, there's one word, you know, like one of them was like re reverse, um, you know, and I like that idea. I mean, if you know, one, interestingly enough, when I was doing some final edits on this book, um, on 13 question, I drew a card 
that said uh, gardening, not architecture. And I was like, great, because the architecture's done. The book is finished. I am. I'm actually gardening. Like, I'm, you know, I'm cleaning up the weeds and making sure the path is straight. Right. So sometimes they kind of, you know, sometimes they're sort of weird in how they, um, how they seem to coincide with what you need to hear. Yeah. Well, I'm going to be spending the rest of my day thinking about bricks and what that means for me. But uh, I've really enjoyed the conversation, enjoyed the novel. Uh, congratulations on it. Uh, I wish you well with it, and I wish you well with the memory book. Thank you, Brad. I really, this is a great conversation. I really, uh, I enjoyed it as well, and I'm, I so appreciate your attention to the book. <laughs>